Hello to our friends joining us via recording. Today is our last day of office hours. It is May 4th and we are doing our last review for the final exam. Um, so we are going to start our discussion today with the process of endochondral ossification, which is the way that we build most of the bones in the body. Let me find my picture here. All right, somebody help me out um, for my friends here in the chat. Is th This would be lesson number seven, eight, lesson number eight, I think. Okay, lesson number eight, so um, endochondral ossification. What page are we on with, with our picture here? Page two, perfect, okay. Um, so we're gonna talk about the process that we go through and build most of the bones in the body. If you guys remember, um, sorry, I saw a note here about the, the types of channels in hearing and, and vision. Make a note for myself. We'll see if we have time for that, Kathleen. If not, I'll chat with you after class. Um, when we talked about building bones using endochondral ossification, um, there was one type of bones. It was a structural classification in the body that we don't build using endochondral ossification. Does anyone happen to remember from way back in the day when we were in class together, which type of bones don't start from, from this cartilage model? There was one group of, of bones that don't. Yeah, it's the flat bones. Yeah, so like bones of the skull, bones like the sternum, bones like those ribs. Um, flat bones don't develop this way, but pretty much everything else in your body does. When we build bones using endochondral ossification, Here's a reminder of what the words mean, right? Endochondral means we are inside what kind of tissue? Does anyone remember? What do we start with? In endochondral ossification, yeah, we're inside cartilage. Remember that chondro part always means cartilage. So endochondral means inside cartilage and ossification is the process of building bone, bone building. Oh, whatever, bone building. <laughs> so we're building bone tissue inside cartilage. Specifically, we're inside the type of cartilage called hyaline cartilage. Remember, there are three kinds of cartilage in the body. There's the fibrocartilage stuff that has a bunch of collagen fibers in it. Um, we also have um, the hyaline cartilage that I'm using to build this model and I'm totally elastic cartilage I was totally having a, a pregnancy brain moment there so elastic cartilage the kind of cartilage in your ears specifically the kind that makes up these models is this the squishy kind called hyaline cartilage so in the process of endochondral ossification we use hyaline cartilage to turn it into bone tissue so remember, this starts really early in, in pregnancy, around week nine. We make sure we have a, a, a model built of your bones. The very first thing that happens to turn this model into bone tissue is we build this thing called the bone collar. So remember the way that we kind of described it in class is that I have this cartilage model. It gets to a certain size, so it's grown enough, and we get to about week nine in development when this model says, hey, look what I can do. I can turn into bone tissue on the outside of this cartilage. And those little cells that make up the bone collar, they're so excited because they've built bone tissue, except their cartilage friends that live in the middle of, of the cartilage model are less excited because when I put bone tissue in this bone collar around the part of the bone here, when I put bone tissue there, I stop being able to get uh, oxygen and nutrients to the middle of my, my cartilage model. So we start to see that in the middle of the cartilage model, the cells start to die. By the way, let's do some, some bone anatomy review here. This middle part of, of a bone, a long bone, because we're looking at a long bone here, what's the name of the middle part of a bone? We have the two ends, but then we have this big middle part. Does anyone remember our technical anatomy word for the middle part here? Yeah, so the middle part of the bone, the middle or what we called in lab the shaft of the bone, is called the 
diaphysis, diaphysis, that's the shaft of the bone. The two ends of the bone are called the epiphyses, the epiphyses. So terminology to make sure we remember, I have two ends, the epiphyses. The good news is that starts with the letter E, so the ends that I have on here. And then I have the diaphysis, which is the shaft in the very middle. So one diaphysis in the very middle, this is where I build a bone collar, where I put those bone cells on the outside. And remember when I put those bone cells on the outside, now the middle of, of this part, the diaphysis of, of this model, starts to turn into bone tissue. I've formed something that we see labeled here called the primary ossification center. The primary ossification center is the first place that I build bone tissue. And remember one of the things that we emphasize during class is that the primary ossification center, where I first start forming bone tissue inside this model, this comes because I've, I've blocked the oxygen and nutrients to the diaphysis of the bone. So this, this ossification center, the primary ossification center, does not form because blood vessels come in. It actually forms because the cartilage cells here in the middle don't have blood supply anymore. So the bone collar causes us to first start building bone. Inside the diaphysis, we make really bad bone because the cartilage cells that live here, they're just grabbing any calcium they can. So um, it, you'll notice that they use this word in the description here where it says it calcifies. All calcifies means is that, that my cartilage cells get desperate and they start grabbing calcium. Um, so they're putting down a bunch of calcium. It's really weak, bad bone. But what happens when they start calcifying is that sends a, a signal to your body or to, to the de developing model here to send a blood vessel inside this diaphysis. So after we've started to form some really not great bone, we bring in uh, our, our artery here that comes that brings with it the type of cells that hopefully we've been reviewing called osteoblasts bone builders my blood vessel comes into the diaphysis it brings with us the cells that actually know how to build bone osteoblasts and they start to build good bone tissue in the middle of of this bone so what we've talked about so far Step number one, we put a bone collar or we put a little thin layer of, of bone tissue on the outside of our cartilage model. Because there was bone tissue on the outside, the middle part of that model starts to die. It starts to turn into bone tissue. Then I bring in a blood vessel to start to build some good bone. Around the time of birth, we then also see some blood vessels that come into the epiphyses or the ends of the long bone. So in the ends, we build what are called the secondary ossification centers, the second place in the bone model where I'm going to be building bone tissue. So both of the epiphyses, both of the ends, don't start building cartilage until that blood vessel comes in. Once the blood vessel comes in with those osteoblasts, now I can build bone tissue again. And from the time of birth, all the way up through childhood and adolescence, we're gonna keep building bone tissue in the epiphyses. We'll keep building bone tissue right here. Remember we have that structure we talked about called the epiphyseal plate. Um, in, in easy words, the other thing we called this was we called this the growth plate. Growth plate. So all through adolescence, we have this epiphyseal plate or this growth plate here as well that's made out of cartilage. Who remembers at about what age does this cartilage go away? When does it stop being a growth plate? Turns into the epiphyseal line. Yeah, so a lot of us are, are chiming in. This is, especially for, for ladies, it closes around age 18, typically. Um, it, in guys, it's a little closer to age 21 or a little bit later. Um, but yes, yeah, somewhere around, around those ages of, of 18 to 21, we'll say, is when the growth plate closes. And when it closes, it becomes what we call the epiphyseal line. Epiphyseal line. But if you notice on my picture here, 
we also have this, this part up here called the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage is this space right here at the top and at the bottom of, of this bone. Articular cartilage is a type of cartilage that we always have on our bones, especially on, on our long bones like this one, because this kind of cartilage makes sure that your bone tissue doesn't rub against each other. So even after this epiphyseal plate closes and becomes the epiphyseal line, we're gonna keep around some articular cartilage here to help with our articulations or to help with, with our joints that we see here. So um, from starting the process of bone building with just hyaline cartilage, all the way up through the bone that I'd find in an adolescent or even in an adult, we go from entirely cartilage to almost entirely bone. We're always gonna have this little tiny bit of cartilage that, that sticks around with us here, the articular cartilage. Thumbs up or um, help me out with what questions we still have about endochondral ossification. What questions we still have? Got some thumbs up, okay. Okay, well, while we're making sure we don't have more questions, let me find my next, my next set of pictures here. Here's what I'll tell you guys, too. Um, as you're preparing for the exam, you've got the list of learning objectives that, that tells you what I want you to know. Um, the other thing to consider when you're preparing for the exam is... Um, my goal in this exam is to help you think about, um, think as practically as possible. Um, so yeah, Eileen says, I've been working on them all weekend. You and me both, <laughs> you're studying them, I'm writing questions for them. So um, my goal on the exam is, to, is to, to ask you questions that are as most useful and practical to your day-to-day -day life. Um, so consider as you're studying the information, um, okay, why should I care about this? Why does this matter? Um, so when we're talking about the process of, of endochondral ossification, <clears throat> we want to be considering why is it helpful for me to understand this? What are some of the big ideas? We just we just talked through it, right? So what are the big ideas that, that are going on in, in this idea or with each of these learning objectives? My, like I said, my goal on this exam is to help you use the information that you've been studying um, to understand your, your real life. So I, I may be a little bit less um, minutia heavy because you're covering information from every, every unit that we talked about. Okay, I had a request for the process of muscle contraction. Um, let me see if I put that picture. Perfect. Here, we're going to use this one right here. The request was for the process of muscle contraction from beginning through the cross bridge cycle. Um, so somebody help me out. I'm thinking we're in it. We're now in lesson number nine. Is that correct? Yeah, we're in lesson number nine now. Um, this is going to be the last. Yeah, your last picture related to this process sounds like it might be on page eight. Um, this is kind of the picture that's a summary for you of everything that happens in the process of, of muscle contraction from when a muscle cell gets the original message to contract down through when it starts the process of contraction. So I think the best way for us to review this learning objective that asks you about all the, the parts of muscle contraction is to use this image and then we can go back and find if there are other particular images um, that, that we want to reference to, we can go back and find them. Yes, Eileen is reminding us this was this was one of the first things we did when we first went online. So uh, look at how far you guys have come, right? Like, look at that. We've learned so much. Even even though we've been online and not been together, we've, we've come a long way. So look at us. The process of muscle contractions starts with a muscle needing to get a message from a neuron. Hey, here, let's, let's do a tie-in question here. This particular neuron that I see in my picture here, it is talking directly to a muscle cell. So this is a neuron that controls the activity of a muscle cell. What would I say is the functional classification of a neuron that talks directly to a muscle cell? 
Yeah, so, so remember the terminology functional classifications. This one I would call a motor neuron, a motor neuron. Because motor neurons are the ones that, like I said, they talk to muscle cells. They control muscle cells. We are looking at the part of a neuron called the axon terminal. Um, and this is a motor neuron. We know that because it's talking to, to muscle tissue. So the message for this muscle to contract came from a motor neuron. And that message came from, um, it, or it, it is sent the same way that neurons talk to each other. So all the stuff that we'll talk about here in a minute about the action potential moving down the neuron, getting to the axon terminal, spitting out the neurotransmitters, all of that happens here. Uh, muscles and neurons, they got to have each other. They, they got to work together. So this neuron is spitting out its neurotransmitters. I saw, I saw in the chat somebody mentioned our neurotransmitter. Here, let's zoom in a little bit. We are spitting out the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is the only message that a muscle cell can give to, uh, uh, or excuse me, that a neuron can give to a muscle cell. When my neuron spits out acetylcholine, it spits out this chemical. Remember that the chemical leaves my neuron and goes down into this space right here that we call the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is the space between the neuron and the muscle cell. They don't actually attach to each other. They're not physically attached, but there's this little space where these little green dot neurotransmitters go down inside of. Those green dot neurotransmitters attach to, notice how I've got these little purple proteins right here. These neurotransmitters are attaching to, let me change color so I can type on top of things. They're attaching to chemically gated sodium channels chemically gated sodium channels. That's these little guys down here. Now, let's let's do all my favorite questions cuz we've got to, right? These are gated channels. They are or are not always open. Gated channels are or are not always open. Not always open, correct. These are not always open. They only open when I receive a particular chemical, right? Chemically gated. The chemical that opens up these chemically gated channels is acetylcholine. That's the chemical that a, that a neuron spits out. So acetylcholine comes down, it attaches to these chemically gated ion channels. When it attaches to them, it opens up and sodium can pass through. Sodium, let's remind ourselves, Sodium has a positive or negative charge. Who remembers? Is sodium a cation or an anion? Yeah, we got a positive charge on that, right? So we, we've got a cation, that is sodium. When I open up this channel for sodium to rush inside, it comes in and it starts to, to use our, our neuron word that applies here too, it depolarizes depolarizes the membrane by the way this this neuron or excuse me this muscle cell membrane when it is at rest when it's not receiving a message who remembers the the resting membrane potential on a muscle cell it's a little bit different than neurons muscle cells yeah muscle cells are a little bit more negative so muscle cells start at negative 90 millivolts the thing with muscle cells is when I start bringing in sodium, we don't have as much of, of a threshold thing going on like we have with neurons. With, with muscle cells, we kind of call it all or nothing. Like if you get acetylcholine uh, that attaches to these channels, obviously we're trying to contract. So um, if I get anything above negative 90, if I open up any of these channels, we're going to depolarize the membrane. My muscle cell is going to contract. So what have we talked about? Step one, acetylcholine spit out at the neuron. Step two goes down into this synaptic cleft. And step three, it opens up these chemically gated sodium channels. In comes the sodium, my membrane starts to get positive. The problem is this picture shows me one location 
where my neuron is talking to my muscle cell. But remember when we talked about skeletal muscle cells that they are very long and skinny. So we've got a skeletal muscle cell here that remember kind of looked like ants on a log because it had all of those nuclei, had more than one nucleus in it. I've got uh, all of this space on my cell where my, my neurons need to, they send a message right here, everybody has to get that message. Yeah, so Mary Lou's absolutely right. If this part of my membrane depolarizes, that's great, but I need an action potential. I need to, to move that change in my charge all across the membrane. And that's where, as we see in our picture down here, that's where the structures that we, we talked about called T-tubules, that's where they come into play. So my first picture showed me at one location, here we'll put the name of that location, at one location called the neuromuscular junction, we, um, we receive the message. That tells that one part of the membrane it's time to contract. That's all well and good until I need my entire long cell to contract. When I need my entire long cell to contract, that's when I'm going to use that thing called the action potential, which is a moving charge. Oops, we'll get rid of that question mark. Moving charge. So my signal comes in at the neuromuscular junction. It's time to take that charge on the road. We got to go everywhere inside this muscle cell so that every part of this cell will contract for me. And the ability of that, that action potential to move all the way across the membrane is because of these structures called tubules. T tubules, I can see in my picture here, are places where I folded in the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. So remember with muscles that we had some special terminology. Their plasma membrane was called the sarcolemma. And anytime we saw this sarco part, remember sarco always means muscle. You see anything sarco, it's muscle. So I take this sarcolemma, this, this plasma membrane, I fold it into these little tiny tubes called T-tubules, and I put them everywhere inside my muscle cell. If you remember from lab when we looked at those, those models or pictures of those models, um, we, we sent in these places where I folded my tube, uh, all throughout that, that muscle cell. It kind of looked like honeycombs in the middle of it. So these T-tubules are basically just another place for this action potential to move across. A place for me to change my membrane charge everywhere across my membrane, including down into the middle of the muscle cell. So my membrane charge, we'll, we'll say here, let's draw a little, little neuron over here. Let's say my neuromuscular junction was right here. Here's that axon terminal, we'll color it yellow. Okay, I, I depolarized the membrane there, and now I'm gonna depolarize the membrane this direction and this direction all the way down my tube. I depolarize this membrane everywhere. As we depolarize the membrane, and this part goes positive, then this part positive, we're going positive all the way around here, we end up bumping into um, some, some voltage-gated channels, voltage-gated sodium channels that are here inside the T-tubule. They are physically attached to some channels, uh, some mechanically-gated channels for the ion calcium. So when I freak out my membrane charge in the middle of the T-tubule, that causes me to push open my calcium release channels and I push open these channels to spit out calcium, to allow calcium to leave. Hey, help me out in, in the chat here. Well, it, it's abbreviated here. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. I won't make you type all that. I just realized they gave you the abbreviation here. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is where I store calcium in the cell. So I'll just, I'll give you that one. The sarcoplasmic reticulum. Let's not type that. This is the place inside my muscle fiber where I store my calcium when I'm not contracting. As I change my membrane charge in here and my voltage gated channels get pushed open because the charge is wrong, that pushes open my mechanically gated channels that spit calcium. Can we summarize uh, as simply as possible, what is the job of calcium? 
when it comes to muscle contraction. How might you describe what calcium does when we're talking about muscle contraction? What's the job of calcium? Awesome. Yeah, so a, a bunch of us are, are mentioning there, there's a, a protein that calcium has to go down to and attach to. Absolutely. Uh, the protein that calcium attaches to is a protein called troponin. Troponin. And remember the way that, that I like to talk about troponin, I called it the pushpin, pushpin protein. It's the, the regulatory protein. Normally, when my muscle is not contracting, I do not have calcium floating around inside that muscle cell. I have uh, actin and myosin that are next door neighbors to each other, but they're not attached because normally actin and myosin are being blocked by a couple of regulatory proteins. One of those regulatory proteins is called tropomyosin. Tropomyosin. The job of tropomyosin is to block the myosin attachment sites. Block the myosin attachment sites. But remember, we talked about tropomyosin kind of like a wet spaghetti noodle. It can't stay in place on its own. It needs a push pin. It needs troponin to stay in place. Troponin normally does a great job of holding tropomyosin in place unless we spit out a bunch of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. If I spit out a bunch of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that's going to go down and attach to the troponin protein, which makes the push pin pop out, which makes the spaghetti noodle move away, which allows myosin and actin to attach to each other. That's how I get to my last picture down here. That's how I'm going to get this spaghetti noodle out of the way by messing up this little push pin right here, troponin. Once that spaghetti noodle is out of the way, myosin can attach to actin. These little spots that are covered right now, I can't interact myosin and actin together until I uncover those spots. So the cross bridge cycle is what I use then to attach myosin to actin and to pull on on an actin. And we can look at a picture, um, a picture of that here in just a moment. I did see a question in the chat that I wanted to address. Somebody had asked back about, about this stage up here. Somebody had asked about IPSPs and EPSPs. Um, so these are things, IPSP and EPSP, these are the types of changes in membrane charge, the ways that, that I can change it. If I make what's called an EPSP, the charge on, on a membrane goes up. If I make an IPSP, the charge goes down. But someone did correctly say in the chat, um, this EPSP and IPSP terminology, this only applies to neurons. With my muscle fibers, these muscle cells down here, they only ever hear one message. The only message they can hear is acetylcholine. So anytime these, this, this cell gets neurotransmitters, it's always going to contract. There's never an option for us to send a message that says don't contract. So, um, yes, yeah, so EPSPs and IPSPs, this terminology only applies to, to neurons. Now, the idea of using chemically gated channels at the very beginning of this process, that is the same as, as what we talk about with neurons. So a similarity between the way neurons talk to each other and the way that a neuron and a muscle talk to each other, at the very beginning, we always start with chemically gated channels. Once we <clears throat> depolarize the membrane enough, then we open up voltage gated channels. So the process is the same. We just don't have this option of sending an inhibitory message to a muscle cell. For my friend who asked that question, um, does that does that help to address your question? <clears throat> yes, okay. Um, and, and I have a question here about our, our calcium release channels down here. 
Um, yeah, the calcium release channels themselves are mechanically gated, meaning they have to get pushed open. They are sitting right next to or they're attached to these voltage gated sodium channels. So the voltage gated channels open up because there's a change in charge. That's the job of the action potentials to open up these voltage gated or voltage sensitive as they're calling them proteins. When the voltage sensitive proteins open, that pushes open my calcium channels that are that are mechanically gated. So I have to push these guys open. They get pushed open when their neighbor protein that depends on this action potential changes its shape. Uh, I got a question that the spaghetti noodle is tropomyosin. That is correct. So we'll go to our picture down here. My spaghetti noodle is tropomyosin. The way you can remember that it's it's the spaghetti noodle is see how in the end of its name it says myosin. So tropomyosin covers the myosin binding sites. It's laying on the place where myosin would normally want to attach. It goes through and covers all of them. Troponin is the little push pin that holds that spaghetti noodle in place. So it kind of looks like here at the end that it has the word pin in it. Um, that's the way I like to remember it. So on top of those myosin binding sites, my spaghetti noodle, and I've got my troponin in that, that holds it in place. And the lower left process is the cross bridge cycle. Um, yes, so the cross bridge cycle is, is what we see down here and we can look at those steps here. I have a picture that shows the actual steps. This is just kind of the summary where the cross bridge cycle would go. So we'll, we will pull up the cross bridge cycle here in just a moment. Um, so the terminology I'll, I'll mention here because it came in the chat. Excitation, contraction, coupling. It sounds really scary. What in the world does it mean? Let's break it down. So the excitation part, excitation just means that there's something happening with membrane charge, membrane charge. Contraction obviously means muscle contraction, muscle contraction here. Coupling means that I put these things together. Excitation, contraction, coupling. Basically, that's what this entire series of pictures shows me. From when I freaked out my membrane charge, let's zoom out. When I freaked out my membrane charge up here, through sending that freak out in the charge, all the way down to the process of muscle contraction, if we were to summarize it as simply as possible, put in one term, uh, we'd call it excitation contraction coupling. The ability to freak out my membrane, leading to the process of muscle contraction. So um, how it's related to the cross bridge cycle, the cross bridge cycle is part of it. Um, but yeah, there's this big, big picture idea what this whole thing shows me is the process of excitation contraction coupling from changing the charge to doing muscle contraction. Um, those are the only, uh, Pam, help me out. Okay, mechanically gated channels, is that what we mean by MGC? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, uh, the only mechanically gated channels in the process of muscle contraction are these guys right here, correct. Um, so the, the calcium release channels are the only ones that we physically push open. Otherwise, at the beginning, we're doing these mechanically gated channels where acetylcholine attaches. We're doing these voltage gated channels to move my signal down the membrane. And then we're pushing open the mechanically gated channels here to release the calcium. Absolutely. Um, Eileen asked if we'll be asking about ATP and ADP on the exam. I can't tell you sure the answer to that question, but we will talk about ATP and ADP. Let me pull up my, my actual picture of the cross bridge cycle. So um, let's dive into the cross bridge cycle in more depth. What page do we have these pictures on? We're still in that same packet. Okay, we're on page five now. Okay, so we're on page five. We are zooming in on the four particular steps of what happens in that, that last pane of our picture. So excitation, contraction, coupling. Here's how contraction happens. So contraction happens using a process called the cross bridge 
bridge cycle. The cross bridge cycle occurs in four steps and it, it just keeps going in a circle as long as I have calcium available. So as long as there's calcium, we will, we will always do this process. So the first step of the cross bridge cycle is cross bridge formation. Cross bridge formation should be the easiest one for us to remember because literally its name tells me what I do. I literally form the cross bridge. So a cross bridge is just a fancy word for saying that mine and actin are attached to each other. Cross bridge formation has to happen for muscle contraction to, to occur. If myosin and actin can't attach to each other, you can't pull them against each other, so we can't do muscle contraction. I'll point out for you, zoom in just a bit to show you, <clears throat> notice that cross bridge formation can't happen without calcium. This is why we had to go through and, and do that excitation part. This is why we had to freak out the membrane charge because the job of freaking out the membrane charge ultimately is getting that calcium released. So whenever I spit out calcium and for as long as calcium is attached to my push pin, I will keep doing this cycle of attaching myosin to actin with each other. Okay, so step one, first thing I do when I'm trying to get my muscles to contract is I attach myosin to actin. This is cross bridge formation. Literally, that's, that's the big thing we want to know. Myosin and actin attach to each other in cross bridge formation. When myosin and actin attach to each other in the process of cross bridge formation, this attachment causes the myosin protein down here to change its shape a little bit. So it attaches to actin and it, it realizes, I have no need for this molecule called ADP. It's been a little while since we talked about ADP. There are two, two molecules that are related to each other here, ADP and ATP. Which of these two molecules, ADP or ATP, which of these has a lot of energy? ATP or ADP? Who's got a lot of energy? Yes, exactly. We're chiming in. The one that has a lot of energy, ATP. And it's called ATP because like someone typed into our chat here, it's triphosphate, triphosphate. By having a third phosphate group attached to this molecule, that's where all the energy's at. So if we look back at our picture right here, when myosin reached up to attach to actin, it was, it was holding onto, or it was attached to ADP. ADP, adenosine diphosphate, this is a low energy molecule. It, it's left over because I stole its energy to get into the right shape. I'm holding on to it because I literally just chopped it up to get into the right shape. Once I attach to actin, myosin realizes there's no reason for me to hang on to this low energy molecule here. I'm going to spit it out. So myosin spits out ADP. And when it spits out ADP, the magic happens here. We do what's called the power stroke. Power stroke is when myosin pulls on actin and literally slides actin along itself. So once myosin and actin are attached to each other, when myosin lets go of that low energy ADP, that allows myosin to actually fold over on itself. It goes from standing up to fold it over. And when it folds, it pulls actin along with it. So two things happen in this power stroke stage. The first thing that happens to make the power stroke occur <clears throat> is we get rid of the dead weight. That's ADP. There's no energy there. I spit it out. The second thing that happens, though, is, is where it gets its name from, the power stroke part. The power stroke part of it is because actin literally slides. This is when actin starts to move. So we've formed our cross bridge. We attached myosin to actin. Awesome. We've now slid actin past myosin. We've done some contraction. The problem is, after I spit out this ADP, after I bend over like this, now I get stuck. I'm stuck, attached, I'm bent over, there's nothing left for me to do. At that point, myosin starts to think about what it might be able to attach to, to be able to, to move on, 
because it, it's pulled on actin, that's its goal. It's done muscle contraction. At this point, a new molecule of ATP comes and attaches to myosin. When ATP attaches to myosin, it causes myosin to say, eh, actin, I don't need you anymore. This is a high energy molecule. I'm happy to just hold ATP. So this is the stage of the crossbridge cycle called crossbridge detachment. What literally happens in, in this stage is myosin and actin detach from each other. The reason they let go of each other is because myosin has now found ATP. Myosin would rather hold ATP than, than hold actin. So in crossbridge detachment, myosin and actin let go of each other because myosin is now holding on to ATP. But as myosin holds on to this ATP molecule, it realizes it's a little bit bored. It's like, I should be doing muscle contraction. Nothing's happening here. And I bent over and I look really sad. I'm at this angle here. So the final stage of the courage cycle is called cocking the myosin head or, or energizing the myosin head, you'll sometimes see. This last stage of the cross bridge cycle is when the myosin head goes from, it was all, see how it was all bent over, over here at an angle, when it goes back to being up in this straight up position, in what we call the cocked position. Because this is the position that myosin has to be in to be able to attach to actin again. The way that myosin, the myosin head can get standing straight up again is by doing this process called ATP hydrolysis. ATP hydrolysis, this is just a fancy word for I chopped up ATP. I technically, if we wanna break it down, I used water to chop up ATP. But the big picture is, is that I, I'm now standing back up, I'm straight up. Yeah, like Eileen mentioned, this gets me ready to start over again. Once myosin is back in this cocked position and it's standing straight up, if there is still calcium, so if I still have calcium attached to troponin, which means uh, that push pin is popped and tropomyosin is out of the way, once I'm back in the cocked position, myosin is just going to attach to actin again, and then it's going to spit out its ADP, and it's going to pull on actin, and then it's going to realize it's stuck, and it'll attach to ATP again. So there, there's a reason it's called the crossbridge cycle, because one step leads to another, leads to a circle that keeps going forever and ever. So this is what, what that last part of, of the picture that we were just looking at, this is what it represented from the process of crossbridge formation, building the attachment between these, these molecules, to sliding them past each other, to detaching them, to getting ready to start over. Um, so I've got a question in the chat, let me pull it back up. Uh, Pilar is asking about voltage gated calcium channels. So way back um, when we were when we were talking about um, this way back when we first went online, mentioned that the, that it is a typo in your notes. Uh, it's not voltage gated calcium channels; they are actually mechanically gated. There are voltage gated sodium channels that are right next to the mechanically gated calcium channels, but those those calcium channels are mechanically gated. Um, so the confusion is there was a typo in the notes packet. That, that's what the confusion is on that. <clears throat> um, what questions do we have about crossbridge cycle or excitation contraction coupling? Or give me a thumbs up. Yeah, Pilar, in muscles, it is always going to be mechanically gated calcium channels. Correct, in muscles. Yes. <clears throat> ah, I got some dance party going on. We might get a couple of penguins today. Let me give you your first penguin today. Here's our first penguin. Penguin's getting excited. Two arms up. Actually, it's showing off what happens when muscles contract, right? Holding up its arms. Look at that. <laughs> I got to do what I can to make you laugh, Eileen, right? We're, we're all separated, so we'll have a dance party. That, that's as good as it gets. We'll raise our glass later. That's as good as it gets. Put it that way. 
Okay. Um, Ashley asked about the hormones. Uh, so this is a, a question related back to unit two. It would be good for you to be familiar with the hormones, yes. Because um, one of your learning objectives for the exam asked how the endocrine system can affect um, affect the density of bones. So do make sure you review those two hormones, uh, parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. Let Make sure to review those. I want to go back to our picture. Let me find it. I'm going to go back to this picture that we spent a lot of time on before. <clears throat> to use this picture um, as a way for us to talk about sarin gas and acetylcholine esterase, because I, I got a question about, about both of those things, and they go hand in hand. Um, so let's add some new text here. Things I will never make you spell, especially not in the chat, right, this early in the morning. Acetylcholine esterase, A-C-H-E. Can anyone summarize for me acetylcholine esterase? This is an enzyme. What does it do? What is the job of acetylcholine esterase? What does this enzyme do? Let's see if we can remember. Exactly. Yep. So, so I like that terminology. It breaks down or it chops up acetylcholine. So its job is to break down acetylcholine. If we were um, looking up even closer, which unfortunately I can't go any closer. Uh, if we were looking up even closer in this space here, the synaptic cleft, we would see that next to these chemically gated sodium channels here, this enzyme acetylcholine esterase is embedded in the membrane next to these channels. Because see, when you want muscle contraction to happen, we spit out acetylcholine. That acetylcholine goes down and attaches to a channel, open that channel for a minute, and then the channel lets go of it. It's, it's done. That acetylcholine shouldn't go over and find a new channel to attach to. Because if it goes over and finds a new channel to attach to, it lets in more sodium <clears throat> and my muscle contracts again. And if I, if I let it off of, of this channel, it might bounce over and go find another channel to open up. And that would lead me to contracting my muscle again. To prevent me from constantly contracting my muscles, we have this enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, whose job is to break down acetylcholine. So once I've heard the message, once I've done muscle contraction, then I'm going to break down that acetylcholine so I don't keep hearing that message. Now that I'm talking about this, I feel like we have a picture. We do have a picture. Here we go. <clears throat> Help me out. What page is this picture from in your packet? We do have a picture of this. Okay, page nine. Awesome. Yeah, so, so we're on page nine. <clears throat> this is this is my picture that, that shows me acetylcholine esterase in action. Here it is right here, acetylcholine esterase, right here. Okay, so how does this process work? Neuron, motor neuron up here, spits out a choline. There's acetylcholine. Acetylcholine comes down, attaches to my chemically gated sodium channel. That opens up, my muscle cell contracts. Then I release acetylcholine from this receptor. This enzyme next door chops it up into acetate and choline. Once it's chopped up, no more messages received. We're, we're not going to, to keep hearing this message. The message has to be complete and put together. It's gotta be acetylcholine for a muscle cell to be able to respond. If it's chopped, once it's chopped up, we're done responding. We only respond to it once. Help me out in the chat. What, how, how does sarin gas change this process? What happens when a person is exposed to sarin gas? What does sarin gas do? Yeah, so, so we've got a couple of different ideas here. So um, the, the first idea, if we talk about the specific mechanism of action, if you were, the specific way that sarin gas works, Sarin gas goes through and it blocks this enzyme right here. So we'll cross it out in red, angry red here. 
the thing that, that sarin physically actually does is it attaches to acetylcholine esterase in the same place that acetylcholine would, except it attaches there and says, nah, I'm not leaving. You can't chop me up. I'm just chilling out here. So your motor neuron keeps releasing its normal level of acetylcholine. That normal level of acetylcholine goes down and attaches to these channels and muscle contraction happens. But remember, once this is done opening up this chemically gated channel right here, I'm going to release it and it's going to float around in this synaptic cleft. Normally, acetylcholine esterase would go through and chop it up for me and would make sure I don't hear it again. But when sarin gas is blocking acetylcholine esterase, now this acetylcholine that I heard once, I will hear it again at another receptor that's over here. And since I don't have an acetylcholine esterase, I'll hear it again over here. And I'll keep hearing this message again and again and again. So um, we were mentioning some terminology in, in the chat about we, have, we end up having too much acetylcholine because the normal amount of acetylcholine that I released, usually I'd chop it up, it'd be no problem. It's kind of like an echo that won't go away. Five minutes ago, you spit out acetylcholine, I'm still hearing it five minutes later. So it, it does things like, um, like we have in the chat, it won't let our muscles relax, or it causes them to keep uh, contracting over and over and over again. So, um, Small scale picture, what's physically actually happening it, when sarin gas exposure occurs, we block this enzyme, acetylcholine. What we see, the symptoms, so things, yeah, like muscle contractions, um, paralysis because the muscle is completely um, contracted all the time, or what can make sarin gas fatal is the inability of the diaphragm to contract anymore. Um, all of it comes down to the fact that I inactivated this enzyme. If I inactivate this enzyme, I keep hearing the same message over and over and over again. My muscles never stop contracting. So sarin gas shows me why it's important for me to have the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. If I don't have the enzyme acetylcholine esterase, any message that my neuron ever releases, I just keep hearing it forever. And that, that's bad news for my muscles. Um, Pam asked if it lives in the neuron all the time. So I'll mention we are talking about acetylcholine esterase in particular related to muscle cells. Um, so this is something that's found on the membrane of, of muscle cells. Although, um, just to toss this out there for you guys, this enzyme also is found on neuron membranes as well. So um, it's, it's attached, it's, it's one of those proteins that are found inside the plasma membrane of a muscle cell or inside the plasma membrane of a neuron. So it doesn't come from anywhere per se, um, it, it, it lives inside the membrane of the cell. It's always there. The only thing that, that gets spit out or released is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is my neurotransmitter, that gets spit out. Acetylcholine esterase is always there. It's always present inside the membrane. And then sometimes I block it, right, with sarin gas. And that could be problematic. <laughs> but, but this is always there. Acetylcholine is not always there. It's just when I release that acetylcholine. Any other questions about sarin? Um, the question is, is a sarin the only thing that blocks acetylcholine esterase? No. Um, we actually, uh, I believe that we have some selective acetylcholine esterase inhibitors that we use um, in Alzheimer's disease, actually. Um, so we, we do sometimes uh, mess with this enzyme with other things. Uh, but the most serious way that we can, can mess with acetylcholine esterase is exposure to sarin gas. Mary Lou mentioned Botox. Um, Botox actually doesn't have anything to do with acetylcholine esterase. Um, yeah, like Mary Lou mentioned, that's actually a problem with, with just the acetylcholine itself. If I don't spit out any acetylcholine, um, there's nothing for the enzyme to chop up, right? Um, but yeah, Botox is an issue where I don't spit this out at all. And then we have the opposite issue with sarin gas where I spit it out once and I hear it a hundred times. So they're, they're kind of opposites of each other.
Okay, per my list, the next thing we wanted to talk about were those types of muscle fibers. So let me pull up our fun little cartoons here real fast. <clears throat> we're at the end of lesson nine now. So at the end of lesson nine, we talked about how there are, yep, we got the lumberjacks, we got the wood, we got all kinds of fun stuff. Talks about how there are three types of skeletal muscle tissue in the body. Three types. Um, can you guys help me out? The I won't make you type the whole name, but the first word, there's two first words that I could use um, that have to do with, with my two my two dumber jacks I see here. Oh yeah, Eileen, Eileen went nuts. She taught she typed us everything, didn't she? Okay. The, the the two types that we have when it comes to the speed of my lumberjacks, how quickly they work, they can fast or they can be slow. When we look at our two lumberjacks here, over here on the left, we have the professional lumberjack. By the way, he would like totally win social distancing, I feel like, right? Like a lumberjack strikes me as someone who just wants to be alone in the woods chopping up their wood. So this particular lumberjack over here, we would consider him a, a fast lumberjack. Um, th this, these words fast or slow refer to the ATPase enzyme that my muscle cells have. ATPase is an enzyme that chops up ATP. Remind me again, um, why do we care about ATP in a muscle cell? What's the job of ATP? Or in any cell in the body, put it that way. It's not just our muscles. Yeah, ATP is, is energy. It's, it's what your body uses. Well, I like to call it the, the energy money of, of your body. So when I talk about the ATPase enzyme, what I'm talking about is the enzyme that allows me to get energy from, from uh, to do things. Yeah, to contract my muscle, exactly. Um, so if I have a fast ATPase enzyme, that's going to mean that I can break up ATP really quickly. Um, if I break, here's a note I'll write for you. If I break ATP really quickly, I generate a strong muscle contraction, a very strong muscle contraction. If you chop up ATP really fast, think about it, um, I'm trying to, to power a furnace, for example. If I can chop up my wood really fast and put all of that wood inside that furnace at once, I'm gonna generate a ton of heat really fast. So my fast ATPase enzymes are going to make a lot of, or liberate a lot of energy really fast. I'm gonna do a really strong muscle contraction. Now, in comparison, we also have slow ATPase enzymes. That's our little hobbyist over here. He likes to chop wood just for fun on occasion. He doesn't chop wood very fast, which means that it's going to take him a longer time to chop up this wood out here. He'll still, yeah, he does look kind of like a hipster, right? He'll, he'll still get through this wood, probably. It'll take him a whole lot longer. Um, but, but here's the thing. It will take him longer to chop up the wood, but that wood then is going to last a little bit longer, right? So when we talk about a slow ATPase, they're not going to generate um, a strong contraction. So uh, slow ATPases, remember the way we kind of talked about these guys? These are the slow and steady wins the race. Slow and steady wins the race which is actually a, a really good way to think about it. Yeah, because these are the type of, of muscle fibers that are going to help you with a marathon. So chopping up your wood a little bit more slowly, we're not making a strong muscle contraction, but we're, chop, we're, we're consistently doing this. We're, we're going slow and steady here. Because see, here's the thing with, with slow and steady. This, this set of, of three logs here, when I have my fast, uh, my fast ATPase chopping it up, if we always put the, the wood straight into the furnace as soon as it's chopped, he chops this up in three seconds, your wood's gone. This guy over here, he pauses for a moment, he takes a drink of his beer, he comes back and chops a little bit more. It might take him three hours to chop up this wood, and then you've got heat for three hours. So the benefit of a slow ATPase 
It's better at lasting a long time. Uh, the benefit of a fast ATPase is I get a really strong contraction really quickly. Yeah, after I said that, Eileen, I was like, oh, this is on, on tape. So nobody report me to the higher ups for talking to you guys about beer. We're all, we're all adults, right? So we're good. <laughs> okay, so we've got slow and fast. That is my professional lumberjack. And that is my hipster lumberjack over here. That tells me how quickly can they chop up wood. But the other thing to know about our types of muscle fiber is um, how much wood supply they have to begin with. So some of my fibers have this pile of wood that's sitting outside their cabin. Then that's all the wood they got. They're going to chop that up and then they're done. Some of them get have an entire forest at their disposal that, that they can go through and they can chop down any of those trees and they can use those, those trees for energy. So this represents the two processes that our muscle cells use to make energy. So it, it's written here for us. The two processes are called glycolysis and the electron transport chain. When we talk about how this relates to the name of muscle fibers, the glycolysis ones are really easy to remember because they're called glycolytic. glycolytic. If I have a muscle fiber that's called glycolytic, the way that it, it makes its energy is using glycolysis. Who can remember or can use their notes to help them out? When I do glycolysis, what am I breaking down? What am I chopping up? Yeah, so I'm, I'm chopping up the sugars that I have stored, right? So um, my energy for glycolysis comes from glucose. Your muscle fibers store glucose in the form of something called glycogen, which is where technically glycolysis comes from. So um, when I string a whole bunch of molecules of glucose, which is my sugar, if I attach them all to each other, I build something called glycogen. And that glycogen is basically really fast energy that's just sitting there waiting to be used. I've already got it in the form of glucose. Right away, I can process it using glycolysis. If I'm using glycolysis to make energy, I can, can make energy from this wood really fast. Because see, the problem over here with my forest is I can go and chop down these trees, but that wood might not be quite ready for me to throw in my fireplace right away. It's kind of like the whole idea if you ever, if you build a fire, you, you want to try to find some kindling or like some little sticks that are dried out because these are still going to be a little bit wet. They, they were alive. It's, it's not going to catch on fire as well. Think about the electron transport chain as it's going to take me a little bit longer to, to make these, uh, this, this energy source work to build my fire, to make my fire warm. When we talk about muscle fibers that use the electron transport chain to um, actually go through and build their ATP, we have a name for those ones. Does anyone remember what those ones are called? They're not glycolytic. If I use the electron transport chain, what word do I use to describe me? Yeah, so the word that I use, if you use the electron transport chain, you're called oxidative, oxidative. That doesn't seem to make a really big correlation, but let me remind you that the electron transport chain needs oxygen. At the very end of the electron transport chain, which were, I'll leave that to your biology class. We're not going to go through and talk about how that works. At the very end of the electron transport chain, where my electrons go to, I attach them to oxygen to get rid of them, to recycle them. So when I have a, a type of muscle tissue that's called oxidative, it means that I use the electron transport chain to make energy. So the electron transport chain, the good news about that is it makes a ton of energy. Remember back from uh, when we were talking, talking about this in office hours way back at the beginning, it's something like 30 to 32 molecules of ATP that are made every single time I do the electron transport chain. Over here on glucose, it's closer to two to four molecules of ATP. And it actually costs me some energy to do this process. So I don't get a lot of ATP that's made out of this process. I get a ton that's made with the electron transport chain. 
we kind of talked about this as almost an unlimited supply of energy. But remember, I've got to have oxygen to be able to do the electron transport chain. And it's going to take me a little while because these trees that I just chopped down, they their, their wood is still wet. So they might not be great to throw in my fire right away. It's going to take me a little bit of time to get some energy out of them. So the way this relates to your muscle fibers then, we have three types, fast, glycolytic, fast, oxidative, and slow, oxidative. What I ask you guys to do in class and what I'll ask you again to do on the exam is to consider what these two words in their names mean. So we're on the page right now that talks about, about this word right here, right? Glycolytic or oxidative. That's based on which pathway they build their ATP. So if I'm oxidative, an oxidative fiber, I use the electron transport chain. I build almost unlimited energy. It'll take me a little bit of time to build that energy, but it's pretty much unlimited. I've got a ton of it. So when we're thinking about things that are oxidative, oxidative uh, types of muscle tissue are really good for endurance type activities or repeated activities. If I don't just need energy once, if I need it for a while, you want to make sure that you've got oxidative fibers because they can keep making energy forever. Glycolytic fibers have a lot of energy available up front. Remember, we've got that chopped wood. It's all dried out and it's waiting. It's ready. Um, and especially since these are fast glycolytic fibers, remember that fast means I can chop things up really quickly and I've got stored easy energy available right away. These are the types of fibers that would be really good for an exercise that just needs you to have a really strong muscle contraction once or twice, where I don't need to be able to do this forever, uh, just, just a couple of times. So fast glycolytic, fast means I make a strong muscle contraction. Glycolytic means it's going to occur relatively quickly because I got that stored sugar waiting. Fast oxidative, again, means I'm gonna make a, a strong muscle contraction but maybe I could do this muscle contraction more than just once because I've got this oxidative part of my name. I'm building a whole bunch of, of ATP. Slow oxidative fibers have ATP that will last for a really long time because I, I make it unlimited and my enzyme that chops it up, chops it up slowly. So I, I'm, I'm not going through my, my energy source as quickly as I would, it makes it last longer anyway. Uh, but I also have an unlimited supply. So these are going to be the ones that, that help us out, like we were talking about on, on the previous image. These are going to be the ones that really help us with something like a marathon, where we're doing something repeatedly for a really long time. Yeah, so Pilar asked then uh, if we need to relate this back to things like mitochondria and hemoglobin, or myoglobin, excuse me. And the answer to that question is yes. Um, so let's see if we, if we remember this here, the electron transport chain is found inside one of the organelles of your cell. Where does the electron transport chain live? What organelle are we inside of? Yeah, we're inside of the mitochondria. That's where all of the proteins that make up this chain, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, that's where they're found is inside the mitochondria. So not a trick question. If I ask you which of these types of muscle fibers up here would have a whole lot of mitochondria, who's got a lot of mitochondria based on what we just said? Who's got a lot of mitochondria? Yeah, it, it's, it's not even just the fast oxidative. It's the fast and the slow oxidative. Anybody who's oxidative uh, is going to have a lot of mitochondria because remember, oxidative means I use the electron transport chain. So if my name includes the word oxidative, you're going to find a lot of mitochondria inside my cells because that's the organelle I use to make my energy, to make a ton of energy. We talked about the protein myoglobin. Myoglobin is like the little brother of what other protein 
that we talked about. What protein is myoglobin basically the same thing as? It's just a lot smaller. Yeah, it's basically the exact same thing as hemoglobin. It's the special kind of hemoglobin that lives inside muscle cells. What's the job of, of hemoglobin inside the body? What does hemoglobin do in your body? Yeah, it's inside those blood cells, helps them with transporting oxygen. And there, there's our key. Hemoglobin transports oxygen. So I look up here at, at my types of muscle fibers up here. Who's going to have a lot of myoglobin? If myoglobin does the same thing as hemoglobin, who needs myoglobin? Yeah, exactly. Anybody who needs oxygen. So I promise it's not as scary as it sounds. You look at the learning objective and it looks scary. I promise it's not scary. I just want you to think your way through it. He myoglobin transports oxygen. If I need oxygen to make energy, I'm going to have a lot of myoglobin. Uh, if I use the process of glycolysis to, to make my energy, my name is glycolytic. Um, the process of the electron transport chain, it's inside mitochondria. So if I use the electron transport chain, I must have a lot of mitochondria. So, yeah, I know I, I saw the comment that, that your brain is tired. I feel ya. <laughs> Try to get a little bit of sleep, drink a little bit of coffee, um, pause for a little bit. Just remember when you approach these questions, it, it's, it's all about what does its name tell me? Because its name will probably give me most, if not all, of the information that I, that I need to be able to answer the questions. So three types of muscle tissue. Make sure we know what the first and last name of these muscle tissues mean. Make sure we know how that relates to hemoglobin, or excuse me, to myoglobin and how that relates to mitochondria and oxygen and, and those kinds of things. Thumbs up or other questions? <laughs> yeah, Carrie says, I'm ready for the toast. I feel ya. <laughs> we, all, we all need to loosen up a little bit, right? <laughs> it's coming soon. We're real close. We're real close. Okay. Um, Next thing on our list is neurons. So let me, let's go here. We wanted to talk about neuron physiology. We want to talk about the IPSP, EPSP stuff. So uh, yeah, Eileen's like, yay for neurons. Hey, so um, promise you, and I, this should come as zero surprise at all, that you will see this graph on the exam. Um, we'll ask you, like the learning objective talks about, to, to label the parts of the graph, so what words we would call them. I will ask you to tell me what kind of channels are involved in different places on the graph. So if you can't label this graph yet in your sleep, um, I know we're not sleeping enough, right? But uh, if you can't label this graph, if you're not really comfortable with it, we need to go back to the office hours where we did this stuff, because um, I promise you it's going to be, be on the exam. When we look at this graph, this shows me what happens in a neuron from the moment it receives a stimulus or from the moment it receives a message all the way up to when it talks to its neighbor, all the way down to when it actually get, it accidentally gets a little bit too negative until it gets back to normal when it's resting and, and waiting for receiving another message. Um, one of your learning objectives that is, is mentioned for you is that we need to make sure we know some of these charges on the membrane. So let's outline them for ourselves. First charge we need to know is called resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential. When I am not receiving a message, what's the normal charge on a neuron? Where do neurons live at normally? Yeah, neurons, neurons normally live at negative 70 millivolts. That's normal, that's happy, healthy for them. Next thing we need to know is a charge called threshold. Let's start with a number. What's the number on threshold? Yes, yeah, we won't forget that one, right? We got to know that one. My, my charge on threshold on a neuron is negative 55. Oh, that was way too low. 
all of your little chat show up right up there. So it's like, I'll just try it somewhere. Here we go. Negative 55 millivolts. And here's my question. Negative 55 millivolts. I can see it right here on my graph. What happens at negative 55 millivolts that makes this charge so important? Why do we care about this negative 55 number? Yes. Yeah, we care about, about this number here because negative 55 is the point when I can open up, open voltage gated channels, open voltage gated channels. Voltage gated channels, remember they open up because of charge differences. So when I get go from negative 70, which is my normal, when I get all the way up to negative 55, my neuron realizes, okay, we're committed. We're going to do this depolarization thing. Until I hit threshold, those voltage-gated channels will not open. So at negative 55, voltage-gated sodium channels open up. At that point, then we'll go through and we'll do this whole process, like several of us have mentioned here, this side of my graph called depolarization, depolarization. I get completely depolarized at this point up here on my graph. What happens at this point here on my graph? At this point here on my graph, how do I talk to my neighbors? What do I do up here? Yeah, so my, my calcium channels open. And when I open up those calcium channels, yeah, this is where I get to release neurotransmitters. I release neurotransmitters. That happens at positive 30 millivolts, positive 30. Neurotransmitter release, or I'm releasing those neurotransmitters up here at, at positive 30. One other charge that we want to know is when my membrane charge gets too negative, hyperpolarized means I'm too negative, and when I'm too negative, I typically dip down to about negative 75 millivolts. Negative 75. So uh, four numbers we want to make sure we're familiar with. Resting membrane potential, where I sit at normally when I'm waiting to receive a message. Threshold value, um, what I have to get to to get those voltage-gated channels open. The charge I'm at when I spit out neurotransmitters, positive 30 to send that message. And when I try to get back to normal and then I go a little too far, when I'm what we call hyperpolarized, that's negative 75. So down here, this part of my graph where we're low is where I'm hyperpolarized. We'll label that part of the graph down here. This side of the graph over here where I'm going from my sent a message to where I end up hyperpolarized. What do I call this part of my graph right here? What's happening right here? What's that called? Yeah, this part of my graph is, is repolarization. Repolarization. So we got depolarization, helping me to get positive. Repolarization, getting me back to negative. Hyperpolarization, when I'm a little bit too negative. And then we got our resting membrane potential, which is the normal that I start with and the normal that I end with. We had the question um, of IPSPs and EPSPs, because we said that's, that's a neuron thing. So um, IPSPs and EPSPs, um, yes, it relates to chemically gated channels, and it's all about this point here on my graph. This area here on my graph, uh, we had a question that, that just asked if this was where those chemically gated channels are involved. And the answer to that question is yes. This is where chemically gated channels are involved. So this beginning part here where it says stimulus applied, remember that the stimulus in, in this whole process is neurotransmitters, it's chemicals. So this is the part where a neuron is receiving its chemicals. We receive those chemicals. Um, yeah, we're doing the process of summation. We're adding them together to decide if I'm getting enough um, excitatory messages that make me go positive, 
or if I'm getting too many inhibitory messages that make me go negative, if I get enough excitatory messages to end up at threshold, that's where, like you guys told me, this is where those voltage gated channels take over. So the process of summation, summation is occurring right here. I'm adding together positives, I'm adding together negatives. I keep adding them back and forth, back and forth. If all of my math comes together and I hit threshold, if I add it all together and get to negative 55, at that point, I have those voltage gated channels that take over. This is the point where, where it, it, all, it's, it all is downhill from there, if you will. I'm definitely gonna talk to my neighbor. So remember that there are two kinds of messages. Let's jump to this page here in your notes. Oh, come on, Blackboard. Here we go. Can someone help me out? What page did we just bump to here in your notes packet? Okay, it looks like we're on page six. So excitatory postsynaptic potentials versus inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. I'm going to add these messages together. Add these messages together. Um, so I'm doing summation with these two types of messages. And if in summation we hit threshold, then we will talk to our neighbor. So two types of messages we get, either those excitatory messages that are telling me you should really share this, this hot gossip with your neighbor, or inhibitory messages that say this is, a, this is a secret, don't tell anybody. If a neuron is receiving an excitatory message, a message that says you should talk to your neighbor, I only have one option for the kind of chemically gated channel that it could have opened up. That one option, the kind of channel it opens up, is a chemically gated sodium channel. Chemically gated sodium channel. Hey, I've done this the last two days in office hours, so for once I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to remind you, Remember how much we love our salty bananas in this class, right? So remind yourself as you're studying, draw yourself a, a salty banana here. Chemically gated sodium channels. Sodium, you told me earlier today, has a positive charge. When I open up a channel for, for sodium, because there's so much outside, all those positives come inside. That's going to allow the charge inside my cell to start going up. So chemically gated sodium channels. If I spit out a neurotransmitter that opens up one of these channels, that is going to lead to sodium coming inside, and that's going to generate for me an excitatory postsynaptic potential, an EPSP. Sometimes the message that I'm sending, though, sometimes the chemical that I spit out doesn't attach to a chemically gated sodium channel. Sometimes it attaches to a chemically gated potassium channel, or sometimes it attaches to a chemically gated chloride channel. Chloride has a negative charge on its, or it's an ion with a negative charge. When I open up the channel for this negative charge, there's a whole lot of it outside, which means it's going to come inside and take its negatives with it. Notice how my, my membrane charge dipped. It got even lower. I'm now farther from threshold. That, that's not gonna help me send a message to my neighbor. If open up a channel for potassium. Potassium is more concentrated inside the cell. So if I open up that channel, potassium is gonna want to leave. But remember that potassium also has a positive charge on it too. When positive charges leave, it's basically subtraction. We go even more negative. So either opening up a chemically gated, let's make a note to remind ourselves, these are chemically gated channels for either potassium, where it spits out a positive, or chloride, where it brings in a negative, either of those are going to make my membrane charge go down. Either of them are going to generate an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. I had a question in the chat. Um, the process of moving these ions, is this facilitated diffusion? Uh, yes, that is correct. Facilitated diffusion 
means that I always go from high concentration to low concentration. That's what diffusion means, high to low. And the facilitated part of, of its name means that I use a protein to do that. So that is correct. Facilitated diffusion is, is what we see happening here. So we add together, let me see if I can find that picture really fast. Um, yes, we do not, remember with muscles, we only ever get excitatory messages. So we do not do this with muscles, we only do this with neurons. Remember this picture here, that neurons are constantly receiving a whole bunch of different messages. Here's a neuron that's got a whole bunch of places where it's receiving messages. It's going to add together those positives and those negatives. It's going to constantly do this process of adding positives and negatives until it hits threshold. Once it hits threshold, then you see this big spike in charge. We're going to go straight up, we're going to depolarize, and then work our way back down. So um, think about IPSPs and EPSPs. These are small little changes that I do in my charge. When I mix everything together in the blender, we do summation. We add all of those messages together. If the sum of all of them gets me to threshold, then, I, then I'm good. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and depolarize and send a message to my neighbor. Any point before this, though, I've gotten a whole bunch of messages. Until I get this message, until it makes my membrane charge different enough, this neuron's not talking to its neighbor. we got to add those messages together and get all the way to threshold to be able to talk to our neighbors. Thumbs up or questions? Uh, Pilar asked if unipolar neurons would do summation. Um, unipolar neurons generally are just collecting information. Um, I, that, that's a great question that I don't know the answer for for sure, Pilar. Um, my guess would be that they don't. Um, because really they're just either collecting information, like they're, they're, they're touching something, or they're not touching something. Um, when we talk about, about neurons, we're generally going to focus on the multipolar ones. But yeah, that's a great question that I, I don't know the answer to. <laughs> you have stumped the teacher. Congratulations. <laughs> Eileen says she's so much better with neurons than muscles. Well, man, we, we sure pounded neurons, didn't we? We did a whole lot with neurons, so I can understand that. Um, Ashley's asking about voltage gated chloride channels. Let me put that question to the class. Voltage gated chloride channels. Do we use voltage gated chloride channels? Who can help me out? Yeah, so voltage gated chloride channels, um, they probably exist somewhere in the body, but they don't exist on neurons. Voltage gated chloride channels voltage gated chloride channels okay chloride channels we do use when we're talking about ipsps we're talking about those inhibitory messages but what kind of gate do they have if we're talking ipsps what's the gated on ipsps yeah the the, the gated on ipsps is chemically gated chemically gated Voltage gated, the only voltage gated that we have talked about in conjunction with neurons. We talked about voltage gated sodium, which is going to help me to depolarize. And we talked about voltage gated potassium, which helps me to repolarize. We did not talk about voltage-gated chloride channels because I do not use them in neuron signaling. So no voltage-gated chloride, chemically-gated chloride, no voltage-gated chloride. And yes, Mary Beth did mention we did have one other voltage-gated as well. We should remember that. Can't forget calcium. Voltage-gated calcium channels. Voltage-gated calcium channels help me to do what? Yeah, Rosa kind of kind of hit on it for us here. Well, calcium channels, they help us to, to send our message 
or to, to release neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters. Voltage-gated calcium channels are activated up here. They bring in that calcium, which remember when the calcium comes in, then I spit out those neurotransmitters because neurotransmitters and calcium, they don't mix. They, they don't like each other. Bring in that calcium, spit out those neurotransmitters. So here are the only three types of voltage-gated channels that we talked about when we're talking about um, neuron signaling. Yeah, good question. We had a request about the refractory period. Let me find my refractory period picture here. Yeah, so I'll mention really fast, these graphs that you have in your notes, excellent, excellent practice. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So uh, maybe print another copy of, of these particulars of the notes. Make sure we can label these things. Like I said, I bet you guys can label these in your sleep. Um, but if you want to make sure that you're good on them, relabel those graphs. You should be in good shape. Right here, refractory period. Let's mention refractory period. When I'm talking about the refractory period of a neuron, um, can you guys describe to me in, in simple words what, what happens in the refractory period of the neuron? What, what's going on with a neuron if it's in a, the refractory period? What are some of our thoughts about the refractory period? Okay, yep, so, so Eileen says we can't make a new action potential. Yep, I like that. That's pretty simple. We can't receive another signal. Love it. Yeah, so refractory period. Um, this is the, the time when a neuron can't hear any new messages. Can't hear any new messages. That's the refractory period. The refractory period has to do with a problem with the shape of my proteins. Hey, here's my favorite question about proteins. True or false? Proteins have to be in the right shape to do their job. True or false? Yeah, absolutely true, right? That's like the whole point of anatomy, right? I hope you guys know that things have to be in the right shape to do the right job. As long as you know that, I, I have succeeded as a teacher. That's all you needed to learn, right? That's all you need to know. So, um, when we talk about the refractory period, the refractory period, it's uh, this is a problem with the shape of which kind of proteins. Who remembers which kind of proteins are shaped wrong to lead to the refractory period? What proteins have the wrong shape? Do we remember? I can see them on my picture, not that they're labeled on my picture here. Uh, it's not the leakage channels. It's somebody here who can change their shape. It's somebody who's gated. We've got a gated channel of some kind. I'll, I'll mention over here, check out my graph. Who is responsible for this part of my graph right here? Yeah, so, so a couple of us are mentioning it, it, it is a problem with voltage-gated channels. Yes, voltage channels, in particular voltage-gated sodium channels. This is a problem with voltage-gated sodium channels. Voltage-gated sodium channels. Remember that voltage-gated, like its name says here, voltage-gated means that charge is what opens or closes me. I open or close a voltage-gated sodium channel once I hit threshold. And when these guys open, they are committed to being open until they really mess up the membrane charge. So here's a picture of voltage-gated sodium channel um, when, I, when I'm at resting membrane potential, when my, I'm not receiving any messages. When I hit threshold, I open up this channel. So I've got a space for sodium ions to rush inside. During the process of depolarization, I have this channel open. But see, this part of my graph where I'm generating my action potential, where I'm depolarizing my membrane, if I already have these channels open, if I'm already in the process of, of sending a message, then 
I can't reopen these channels because they're already open. I can't hear a new message because I'm still hearing the first message that I heard. So we're shooting up with voltage gated channels, sodium channels that are open up here. When we reach this peak up here at the top, this is when I spit out my neurotransmitters. At this point up here, Eileen mentioned the ball and chain. See this little guy down here? The ball and chain part of this protein. When I get all the way up to positive 30, that ball and chain pops into place on the voltage gated sodium channel and says, okay, wait a minute. We have way overdone this. We are positive 30. We're supposed to be negative 70. We've made a mistake. So the ball and chain protein uh, goes into the place and it covers up this voltage gated sodium channel. Now the voltage gated sodium channel is open, but it, it's a stopper in the bathtub. We're, we've got it it's shut. We're not going to be able to, to get this protein to open up again because that, that bathtub stopper is in place. Now, as I start working my way, as my membrane charge starts to go back down, because those voltage-gated potassium channels uh, help me out and start lowering my, my membrane charge, what will happen slowly over time is this channel will close itself back up, and this ball and chain protein will get out of the way. So it's no longer going to block it. When I get back to this shape, I'm going to be able to receive another message. Now I can hear again. So it's a lot about these voltage gated sodium channels. In the absolute refractory period, they're completely in the wrong shape. Now this relative refractory period, um, the relative refractory period is actually due more um, to my voltage gated potassium channels. We're actually gonna blame the the relative refractory period on those guys. Because when we get to about this point right here, getting close to threshold value, my, my voltage gated sodium channels are getting back to the right shape. But I'm still rapidly repolarizing my membrane. I think the example that we gave in class when we were talking about this is you're skydiving, you're jumping straight down. If we were trying to go back up, to that plane that we jumped out of, it's a lot harder than if we had just stayed in the plane. We're, we're rapidly repolarizing a membrane and shooting down. Um, you have to get back to threshold while I'm actively pulling, spitting out positives, while I'm actively repolarizing my membrane, it makes it a lot harder for me to get there because I'm, I'm in the process of making my membrane more negative. So yes, like, like the chat says, I, I could hear something in the relative refractory period, but for me to be able to hear something, I'm going to have to have a really loud message because I'm currently basically um, receiving IPSPs all the time. That's kind of what repolarization is to some extent, is just, just getting more and more and more negative, which is what IPSPs do. They make the membrane charge negative. So relative refractory period, we can thank those potassium channels for that because they're making the membrane charge negative. Absolute refractory period, that's all about those sodium channels. The sodium channels are bringing in sodium, they're in the wrong shape. I can't, I can't start this process over. Thumbs up or questions about refractory period? Or we could have a dance party. So it's a problem. It is a problem with the protein um, and a problem with the voltage gated channel as the same. Uh, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, Pilar, um, what I'll say is that a voltage gated channel uh, is a type of protein. Um, so it is a problem with, with the shape of a protein. It's a problem either with my voltage gated sodium channel proteins um, or it's a problem with, with these voltage-gated potassium channel proteins that are, are bringing in too much potassium for me. Yeah, so, so basically, yes, it, it's, it's one and the same because these are our proteins. Okay, so I'll mention one last thing here, the one last topic that we had a question about. And then we'll we'll get to pull out our glasses together and, and, and toast. Um, there was a question about the role of mechanically gated channels in hearing and balance. Um, let's remind ourselves with mechanically gated channels, 
how do we open up mechanically gated channels? Mechanically gated channels. Yeah, these are all about pushing, right? These are all about pushing. Okay. So when we're thinking about the role of mechanically gated channels in hearing and in our two types of equilibrium, um, what we want to be thinking about is what pushes on these channels to open them. And the other thing that we want to be thinking about with these type of channels is um, are they being pushed open or being pushed closed? So when you're trying to, to review the processes of, let's put it over here, we got hearing, we have static equilibrium, and we have dynamic equilibrium. Here's, here's the study questions that I would, would encourage you to use when you're, you're trying to figure out what do mechanically gated channels do. Um, when we talk about the process of hearing, actually when we talk about each of these things, we talked about kind of the three states for what I can be doing. So with hearing, for example, we talked about how you can be waiting for a sound, you can be hearing a sound, or you can just have stopped hearing a sound. With static equilibrium, remember that was the ways you can fall asleep in class, so head forward or head backwards, or your head is upright. We want to know uh, for each of those states, what is it that would push their channels open? And are they being pushed open or being pushed closed? Same thing with dynamic equilibrium. That was the spinning one. So um, what is it that's pushing on these channels? Are we pushing them open or pushing them closed? The way we can tell if we're pushing them open or closed, um, it has to do with the, the number of messages that the neuron receives, the number of messages that the neuron receives. I think the word that we used in our office hours before, it was all about the rate, right? All about the rate of sending messages. So my, my study tip for you when you're working on that learning objective, the role of mechanically gated ion channels in hearing and in the processes of equilibrium. Make sure we know how we push things open or closed, um, what structures are pushing on them, and make sure we know um, what's going on with with the rates what we're being pushed at okay it is now actually 11 20 I'm gonna send my message to get my amazing glass of grape juice coming in here see if I if I get my little my little skeleton girl in here I know Eileen we've made it we made it so um, if you guys want to pull out your cups if you, you brought a cup of something, um, we are going to, we're going to together, I'm going to turn off my, my whiteboard here, stop sharing my screen, that'll make some of us smaller, some of us bigger. Once I get my glass of grape juice in here, I will propose a little toast to us, um, see if my, my daughter comes in as well. I, I think I told you guys this, last time she was on camera, um, she was like, why didn't anyone else turn on their cameras? So um, actually, I'm going to pause the recording, too. So let me pause the recording. Goodbye to uh, to friends who are watching us via recording. Good luck on your final exam.